you're if you are new to us, uh, just very quickly, I'm Craig Hess. I am the director of individual corporate and international training here at SATE. And there's that pause where I'm supposed to say, and I am Jenny. Yeah, so we're going to rehearse this. Yeah. <laughs> no, nothing. That's why I love it. It's nothing's rehearsed. Very emergent. Uh, my name is Jenny, <clears throat> and I am a leadership development specialist for SATE's uh, corporate training and spend a ton of time in classrooms with good people like yourselves, facilitating a whole host of our deliveries that we have, most of them around leadership. And as I like to say, the fun things, sensibly, we call them soft skills or power schools. Um, my power skills. My early job on a Friday morning is always to help everybody who's in the room just to take a moment and pause. <clears throat> and we all have a pause here in Canada coming up. Monday is our National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, which is all about our Indigenous people, Canada's history, and the truth and the reconciliation journey that we are on. So I thought this morning, it's about learning, that I would just take a couple of minutes to explain the official um, symbol, which you can see on the screen there, if you're here in person with us and watching. So three particular symbols that stand out for representing our Indigenous people. The eagle is for our First Nations, the narwhal for the Inuit, and the beaded flower for our Métis people. The circle that you see in the middle there represents the spirit of reconciliation. But as always, the circle is together in the spirit of reconciliation. The color orange is for truth telling and healing. And I really encourage anybody listening this morning, go look this up. The story behind Truth and Reconciliation and the orange t-shirt is a story that anybody who lives in Canada and anybody who's interested needs to know. The pathway coming through the middle is our road to reconciliation. And this is important too, it is a journey. It is not about one day in the year. This is about every day in our year. And then finally, the stars just up at the top there. Those stars represent the children who never came home from our residential schools. So for Craig and I and Seed, we are situated on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot people and the people of Treaty 7. Those include the Siksika, the Pakani, the Kane, the Sutina, Stony Nakoda, the Chiniki, and the Good Stony. Calgary is also home to our Métis people as well. Thanks, Craig. Perfect. Thank you, Jenny. Um, always so very well done and um, <laughs> great to throw that learning in this morning. And uh, obviously, very important, very important uh, topic for us to always uh, consider. So as we progress today, and uh, again, if you're just coming into the room, uh, please just uh, carry on the conversation in the chat. We will try and keep an eye there, but it usually flows past us pretty fast. Specific questions, and I see one in the Q&A section already that uh, we will get to. Uh, I think we'll definitely uh, cover that. Um, but we're here today to talk about performance, specifically poor performance. And, uh, you know, although that could relate to my first couple minutes of dialogue as we uh, get going on these on these episodes, I think in general, uh, Jenny, we're, we're taking this a little bit more seriously in terms of you know, you are a leader and you have people on your team and you have results that you have to achieve and you have expectations of your people and your team. But I think um, to start with, where we need to kind of go before we can talk about how to manage poor performance or how to handle poor performance is to actually define it. What mm -hmm. is poor performance? Probably the hardest, best question of the morning. Well done. And we're done. So this is really difficult. The, the, a leader... The worst thing a leader can do is to prop up poor performance. I think we said that in our blurbs as we advertise today. And the worst behavior that any leader is currently tolerating is a marker of culture within the team. And the problem that stems with poor performance is how do you define it? And it's really, really difficult to define if you haven't actually talked about what performance is. So I'm going to bail and say there isn't actually a definition. There's a delta between your expectation and what you're getting. That could be poor performance. But within there, I'm going to encourage everyone to remember that everybody has a bad day. So are you looking for the patterns 
of poor performance. If this is happening three times in a row, is that poor performance? There's a there's a starting point, possibly. Could be on you, could be on them. And then there's also, and it's quite infamous, this skill will matrix. That's always a popular one that people pick up. So is this coming, is this delta between what you would like and what you're getting? Is it down to a lack of will or a lack of skill? And depending on that, there's different approaches as well. But then I think we've also got to look at have we got people in the right roles and doing the right tasks? Because if you give Jenny a job on Excel or something that's all to do about tracking our data and all the rest of it, I will be a poor performer for you. But you might not want to get rid of me. So I might be useful in other places. <laughs> so it, there you go. There's an entire paragraph and a half to pick from. Yeah. And, you know, I think you know, it's a good place to start because you, you raise a number of good points about what it truly is or isn't, or it could be perceived to be, you know, one day is not a, you know, one day is not bad performance in a career per se. Uh, but I think, I think most, most leaders, most managers know what poor performance is when they see it. Right. And they know um, you, you can kind of trust your gut. You have a feeling, you know, if, if something doesn't seem right with respect to uh, what you're expecting from an individual in terms of production, hitting their target, quality of work, interaction, it, it, you, you know, you really touched on it when you said um, it's about the culture that you're willing to accept, right? Yeah, yeah. Right? And so there's a whole, there's a whole pe a bunch of stuff in there that we could un unpack but I think for me, it's really important to try and figure out, you know, how do you know when it's truly underperformance or when it's somebody needing more support or that there might be something else mm -hmm. going on? So this is where you've got to be clearly defined in, in what performance looks like. And just in case we have, oh, I'm sure we do have some people in here who haven't heard us talk about this before. There's a clear delineation between your results and your performance. And so the results are the numbers. You'll always get results. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's your output or your outcomes that you're looking for. Performance is how we get there. So if we've had that conversation around what performance is, and I, and I loved what you said, there is, there's a gut piece in there. We know. And the first time you might be like, oh, it's just a, maybe that's just a bad day. But the minute that you start to see a pattern to this and it's not sitting well, that's the point where a conversation is a good idea. And the reason that performance is so hard to define is because sometimes we're caught in, it's the best way to put it, like a, it's context limiting, like our context limits the performance that we can give. And so that's actually a really good conversation. And I, I struggle to always go back to the pandemic, but in the pandemic, there were some companies that didn't change any of their performance measures. Now, when we see that now and here with that hindsight, that's crazy because our context was so limited. Mm -hmm. there, there could have been some great conversations there. So I, I think it comes back to what is it that you're looking for? And the minute that that's not happening, there's the opportunity for a good conversation in there. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing, too, um, that we've talked about before that um, you always need to as a leader ensure that you're looking for is, you know, is, is that individual in a space where they can actually perform? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something else going on in their life that you, you know, that they haven't shared with you, not that they need to share everything, but, you know, I think you need to check, you know, check in and make sure that an individual is actually in a space where they are capable of doing what you're asking them to do. I think mean, that always needs to be there. But, you know, in times of stress and times of down performance and everybody's running and trying to get things accomplished and move things forward, it is sometimes very easy to um, forget to take that moment and just mm -hmm. check in and, and say, and we're all human as leaders, right? You're trying to drive a result. Uh, but if you don't actually pause and make sure that, you know, your folks are in a spot where they can uh, get the job done, mm -hmm. you might be missing something really important. Big time. Yes. I mean, that's... And that's so part of our lives at the moment. And, and we keep saying this to leaders all the time, know your people, know yeah. your people, know your people, know your people. And, you know, much of the performance conversation and whether we achieve high performance or not comes down to the trust and the relationship that we have. 
And so, you know, discretionary effort, which is a marker between poor performance and great performance, comes down to how I feel. Well, if you care, I feel differently than if I think you don't care. So, you know, or if I trust you, I am willing to push the boundaries a little bit. High skill, high will. You've got somebody who's excelling. You've got somebody who's usually quite happy to try and push the boundaries. And so that makes a difference to what we're looking at. So <clears throat> one of the things where you think you've got poor performance that I really encourage is instead of going that way first, and we, and we that's easy, right? There's an issue, let's tackle that issue. But before you go that way, come this way, right? What part did I play in this? How did I contribute? What, was there more to this? And sometimes that's the, the conversation that you just talked about. Is that person in a place where they can perform? But sometimes, you know, I've told you three times, great, three times the message hasn't made it. Okay, let's look at how we're giving the message. Is that fair on the person? What do they need in order to get it? So, yeah. Um, so let's make an assumption here that we've got clear expectations. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what is expected of you. We know you've got the will to do the job. Okay. Um, and <laughs> This is where I always struggle in this this piece of you know separating the as you called it out earlier results versus performance, mm -hmm. right? And you know full transparency. I have a long history of business development where your performance is your result. I as as I've always um, had leaders that kind of put it to me that way, but performance isn't there. What next? Why do leaders struggle with this conversation? Why do some leaders struggle with this conversation? How do you start going about having this conversation now? So there's a couple of things in there first. The reason that you said but is because you negated everything beforehand. So performance isn't results. like, <laughs> And we can go around that so many times. Are you picking on my performance as a moderator of this conversation? <laughs> no, not at all. So that, that's one part of it. Secondly, is these often feel like difficult conversations. Like as humans, most of us want to be liked. We don't like upsetting other people. These are harder conversations to have. And nobody ever said leadership was easy. So they are hard work conversations. And, you know, sometimes we just, sometimes we've never been taught that's fair. Like we haven't been taught, we've been taught that feedback has to be, it hurts me to say this, you know, constructive criticism. And, and many of you will have heard me say this before. Those two words don't go together in a sentence. So we're actually not set up to have the conversation really well. And the other problem I think, and sometimes it's just down to being pure busy. And sometimes it's down to that fear of the difficult conversation, but we don't have it as early as we could have. And so you know, the key always is the minute that you start to see a pattern, like, okay, everybody has a bad day. We've done that check-in. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, whatever. And and we, we're convinced to the extent that we can be that they are good, but then it happens again. And then again, okay, now you have a pattern. That's the point where we want to get into that conversation. And we put all the weight on ourselves in that conversation and forget conversation is you and me. So it's 50-50. So often we could even start with a simple question and, and give the control of the conversation to the other person. It's their job. They're the one doing the work and then start that conversation. But if you're not seeing your people and having that conversation enough, then it feels really difficult. And I think that's what puts the brakes on them. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, for me, the key thing in this is, um, as soon as you're feeling it, start talking about it. Yes. Yeah. Right. The longer you put this off, the far more difficult it becomes. Something that just kind of tweaked for me though, is, you know, as, as a leader, you're taking a look at it and you're going, Oh, this performance isn't up to par. How often do we assume that the individual that you're going to have that conversation with thinks that things are fine? Uh, all the time. Right. And, and, and are, are, you know, and, and are they on the same page as you or not? Are, do they also think maybe, yeah, I'm surprised Craig hasn't come to talk to me yet because things aren't going well. <laughs> so I think we, at the beginning, we said, let's assume that the expectations have been clear. 
And that's a huge assumption that we make continuously. Agreed. Yeah. And we we work we I think we work sometimes quite cryptically. And so we don't actually speak very clearly at all. And we don't always check in that the expectations have been met. And so your expectation of the experience that people have when <clears throat> they're with our facilitators could be really different than the than the expectation that the facilitator has when they re- walk into the room as to what a good experience is. And we don't often match those things together. We assume, and it's positive intent, like this is the other thing, there's, there's rarely the intent to sabotage going on. And we assume that we just, we, we meet in the same place, but we will never do that. And so it comes back to that conversation around performance and what's involved is that's a huge conversation and teams don't often do it. Like performance goes beyond the technical skill. The performance is technical, it's tactical. There's a mental part. Like people who work for you get rejected all the time. That is a huge emotional labor to, to work through that part. And then there's for me, for me specifically, you said no from other people, not you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Kate. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So they, but there's so much in there. And then we're back to that context. Are you actually set up to perform well? And you know, we're looking at offices that have cubicles, and most people find a cubicle a distraction. Okay, are you set up to perform well? Now we look at people who you know are using out of date technology are you set up to perform well no not necessarily so i just think we have to be aware that is it's bigger than just a person doing a job and it's there's a fairness in recognizing that but that doesn't mean the conversation doesn't happen yeah yeah no absolutely we've spurred a number of questions here that okay. i think are going to cover some of the things that we wanted to get through so but the first one kind of plays in a little bit still with this role of making sure expectations are clear. And that is, could you speak to the challenges a new leader may face coming into an established team of five plus years? Previous leadership did not have high expectations of the team and the team received high performance ratings and results. The new leader is now, yeah, the new leader is now challenged with lack of performance and results. How do you redefine that performance culture while still motivating and engaging a team that is not used to the high standards and think they're performing exceptionally. It's going to be an uphill climb. Um, yeah. that, that's tough and, and common, I'm afraid. So where I would go to with that, if it's possible, and, and this is, this is cool for any team, even if you're not a new leader to it, can you press pause? So we get really busy executing and executing is doing the day job, but it's really healthy to pause with a team intermittently, not every day, but intermittently. And so in that pause, I would be digging in with the team as to how do they see performance? So let's say lots of companies say, well, we're going to be world-class. Okay. As a team, let's define world-class. Let's agree on what that looks like. And let's agree on what the behaviors are that lead to a world-class execution. Because if you can set that standard with your team, then the team has ownership. So in this conversation, you're definitely the hippo, highest individually paid person's opinion. And your job is to let the team do most of the talking. It doesn't mean you stay silent. You do have a part in that conversation and you'll have you'll have some non-negotiables in there. There'll be things that are really important to you that you're not willing to let go on. Your team needs to hear that but your team needs to be a really big part of that. And that's going to take a pretty robust conversation. And I'd encourage you within there to remember those six elements that make up performance. So that was technical, what's the skills that they have? Tactical, what's the strategy? And do we have the capacity to hit this new level? Because you'll be asking them to do, to work differently. Um, there's mental, there's emotional, there's physical, and then is the environment set up for them to work the way that they want to go, the way that they want to move? And then within that conversation too, what does success look like? What does failure look like? And what will we, and that's a real we, do about that? And so that's it. It's a big conversation, but in order to go there, they have to have as clear an understanding as you. And you may have to give up on a few things within there, Mm -hmm. and it may be gradual. 
But by doing that, it makes the any subsequent subsequent conversations much, much easier because if you've got the notes from that conversation, everybody's got the notes and the understanding, it's much easier to say, okay, so we talked about this, this, and this, and I'm seeing this and this, and not this. All right, how do we bring this back in? How do we hold ourselves responsible to this? It just, it makes your pathway much easier. The other thing that I will throw in here is it is more important to catch people doing it right, especially in this situation that we're just talking about, as much as you can. Yeah, I'm trying to reinforce what you were looking for. Mm. So what I'm hearing you say is it's not as simple as just saying there's a new sheriff in town. No. No. No, it's, you know, it is it is hard work. And especially, I think, um, you know, most leaders have probably been in a situation uh, where they have inherited the uh, quote unquote problem child that has, for whatever reason, mm-hmm. never had the prior performance conversation, which makes life mm-hmm. really difficult. It's, it is a tough reset, um, especially if somebody pulls out past performance appraisals and says, nobody's ever had an issue with me except for you. Yeah. You know, at that point, yeah. if, if you're starting from there and if you're a brand new leader, I might go back to marcus buckingham's questions and start with asking people what they love doing and what Mm. they love doing because back to my point earlier when i am involved in what i love doing i am a high performer when i'm involved in what i loathe doing (laughs) i am not a high performer by any stretch and you know we often want to go to manage out or coach out and sometimes that's realistic like some people are in the wrong job sometimes if my entire day, if I don't have anything that I love doing in my day, well, I'm either in the wrong role or I'm just not getting those threads of things that I love. How do we bring them back in? And I think you've got to do some digging within there to find out what's behind that that story. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Mario just put through the comments in the chat. Clear as kind, right? Trying to make sure that you're, you're resetting that. All right. Uh, another conversa- uh, conversation question here. How do you recommend we handle poor performance when we have a team member who does not report to you, especially when their leader has been informed and does not do anything about it? Yeah, this is tricky. We have a lot of dotted line reporting going on these days. Um, I think, again, some well, sometimes it's context, but it depends. If they're on your team because their work matters to your team, that's purpose. And so the more that you can build that conversation, connect them to the importance of what the importance of what they do to how to the next steps. Like they do this, and so this has an impact on this, this, and this. That's one conversation that can help. It gets very cool when teams involve peer-to-peer feedback as well because if that person is holding up my role and we have a culture of peer-to-peer feedback I'm probably the best person to give that that's a pretty advanced culture if you've got that kind of culture of feedback yeah I can take take a ways to get there um, yeah. yeah for sure <clears throat> um another question here and this is an interesting one. How do you deal with poor performing volunteers? Uh, I have a nonprofit volunteer board of directors uh, where we have a couple of poisonous contributors. Uh, do you have any recommendations on how to handle? I've been that person and I've been I've been the person that works with the the volunteer board. <clears throat> um, it, it depends on. Classically, governance of nonprofits where you're reporting into the board there, your line of communication is either to your operations committee or to your president. And so technically that's where your conversation sits. And I think it's highlighting the gaps that they are leaving. So because this board member is not doing their job, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the impact on our organization and the board. Now, most not-for-profits in that situation are very reliant on grant funding, other things within there. So as you're having that conversation, be very clear 
on the impact that that would have on the organization or on you as the executive director, general manager, whatever the, the title is there. So I would start by sticking to those classic channels. It's a really tricky area because people who volunteer most of the time do it for good, do it because they care and they have a really busy life too. Like I had to leave a board of directors because when they needed me to work was my busiest time in my work here. The, those two mm -hmm. don't match because I just couldn't deliver what they yeah. need. So be aware of the story, use your communication channels and always talk about what the impact is either on the organization or your ability to do your role, to fulfill your role. Yeah. Uh, and Janelle just uh, popped us a comment in the chat that uh, if your nonprofit has a code of conduct, you, you could potentially refer to that as well. But what you what you just touched on there in that peer to peer piece yeah. uh, and the, this question with the board, I'm wondering if you have some recommendations and maybe some tools that we could share with folks or ways to think about how do you actually encourage and get peer to peer feedback going and where i'm going with this one is that of course if you have these poor performing board members maybe there's other board members you could leverage to try and bring them along so how do you again lots of caveat here around you need the psychological safety trust to be able to do that but let's let's assume that exists and you can we can get a little bit more tactical and practical around how do you encourage and have peer-to-peer -peer feedback yeah. proceed yeah, I think it's not normalizing it. I don't know if that's even a word, but it's making it part of our normal practice. And, and there are good examples. Um, and Netflix were known at a time for the way that they implemented this. And for the longest time, it was very healthy for them. I think it actually swung too far. I can't, I can't remember the details. So the, there are places you can go for extra information. Um, the easiest way to normalize it, if you have a regular meeting is to include it within your agenda or include it within your connect before content and the simplest simplest model is what do i we you depends how you're using it need to stop start continue and that can be a very healthy way of surfacing um you know perhaps things that are holding us up or the impact that something is having and the more that we repeat, the more that we practice, the better we become at it. The other part I'm going to come back to is we need to remember that feedback and, and lots of people who are regular here will have heard me say this a lot of the time. I call it feed forward now because the aim is to elevate forwards. We want to do this. When we give feedback, typically we create attention. And when we give feedback, it's very much me versus you this is how i see it this is what i want you to do at its worst i think you should be like me that's just rude to most people but that's the way we go in and that's attention people don't want to be like me and so if we actually can stand side by side and say this isn't working very well what do we do about this as we're looking at the issue together that's a healthy way but we just we have to practice it and we have to normalize that and you know, sometimes in its heart, we actually have to talk about what what do we mean when we say feed forward? And and most times, like if I say, okay, Craig, I, I need to give you some feedback, every person, maybe not yourself nowadays, but would go to, oh God, what have I done wrong? And immediately the hairs are up on the back of our neck, we're expecting negative. But that that magic ratio, it's in our final slides today, five to one, five positive to one constructive or five positive to one negative, if you want to use that language. And so that's the way to bring it in, is that we recognize and catch everything going right, so that when you need to talk about that one thing, you're basically you're interrupting the schedule to focus on this because it's holding us back or it's affecting the number. And we can see it clearly, that's the conversation, but it becomes easier when it's safer to what you said earlier, that safety is important. Absolutely. So your your um, comment there around asking, uh, requesting to meet with somebody to give them some feedback mm -hmm. uh, ties in with another question here is how do you deal with a team member who receives almost all feedback, no matter how gentle, as accusations and gets defensive very easily? So that's common. There's a lot of people whose experience 
the story so far, that's what it's been. Like we have, we've lived in a world where we've highlighted the we weaknesses, we dressed it up beautifully and called them opportunities, which is rubbish. And and we focused on where we're not good enough. Like if you really interesting exercise, you say, okay, you've got 30 seconds to write down all your weaknesses and 30 seconds to write down all your strengths. The first list, most people will go like easy. Second list, they stall after one, maybe two. This is incredible for everything that we have. You you can't really have a job today if you don't have a whole ton of strengths that you're bringing to the job. And so it, it's almost like recreating the safety for them. So for somebody like that, I would suggest, look at that ratio. Are you catching them doing it right more than you're offering that reinforcement to change behavior, more than you're offering that constructive or that interrupt, like we've got to stop this for here and be really, really patient please because chances are they just they don't know and i think if you have the safety you can you can acknowledge that like if you were to or if i was to offer you that feedback and you became defensive or whatever and that wasn't my intention there and then in the conversation i say craig it actually looks like i've hurt your feelings with that conversation we're not talking about you as a person we're talking about this task what are you seeing that i'm not seeing and then, and when you ask a question like that, stop talking, let them answer. Very good. Um, I have to chuckle a little bit, Jenny, that the, the Q and a section is flying by like a waterfall today versus the chat. <laughs> There's so many questions queued up here. And so I'm going to try to get to a few more of them before we have to wrap up. And what I will say folks is that I can actually picture as needing to, uh, bring performance back uh, as a future conversation, perhaps even before, the Christmas break, we might think about how we uh, adjust our schedule. But uh, calling out poor performance can come from a non-leader, such as an employee needing to call out their manager or supervisor. How do you differentiate? How do you differentiate uh, someone bringing up these com concerns compared to constantly being viewed as a complainer, a toxic employee, etc.? So managing up is always tricky because we always forget that the person you're managing up to is a human as well. We're all human. <laughs> um, so, all right, first off, those of you who have leaders who ask you for feedback or feed forward, whatever language they're using or insights. So this new word that's coming to like, what are your insights on this? Um, please, please answer them because that's so healthy that they are asking for that. Secondly, if you are a leader and you have a, a team member or an employee who, who says, may I offer you what I've been seeing or may I offer you some feedback, do, do whatever you can to cage your ego just for a minute and, and thank them because the courage behind that conversation for most people is crazy. So we need to recognize it differently as it, when it comes up in conversation. For... Talking to that leader, it's just, if you have the psychological safety, if you have the relationship, it is as simple or can be as simple as, you know, would it be appropriate for me to offer you what I've noticed or what I'm seeing or whatever that might be? Now, here's the key. If they say no, thank you, <laughs> you got to leave that. And, mm -hmm. and there's maybe 101 reasons to your point earlier today, Craig, why people are saying no, thank you. There are a lot of people who are, that they're literally making it through the day and it may not be a good time. But the thing is that they will have heard you and you will have planted the seed and they might come back. There is, you know, there's 101 reasons why that might happen. There's a conversation in itself. And then when you're having the conversation, what we want to remember is it's about a behavior or about a task. It gets harder if the feedback is how I experience you. Mm hmm but I think that if we can keep it specific and based on what you have, you know, you can, I heard this or I see this or when I, when I hear this phrase and then what is, how does that, what's the impact on that? How does that feel? And be really clear on what your request is. But I would say in that part as well, are you recognizing what's going right? Because when we keep looking for what's going wrong or what we don't like, we will always find it. Yeah. Interesting enough, if you start looking for what's right, you will always find that too. And so there's a magic 
sort of amalgamation of both there. Yeah, it's interesting. I wonder how many of us have actually said to our leader, you know, I real I appreciate what you do for me here, or I oh, like that you do that. Do that. Right? Yeah. Versus, yeah, versus always going, you know, what the hell? You didn't support me there, right? Yeah. Right. Um, so many questions here, Jenny. I'm just trying to pick through. I think there's there's one here that you and I talked about beforehand, um, and the, the answer to this is probably an obvious one, but over the past few years, there's been a move away from performance reviews, formal performance reviews, for formal ratings, et cetera. Um, you know, this conversation of addressing poor performance, well, we don't do reviews, so how can I address poor performance? I am of the belief. <laughs> and there'll be lots of people smiling because they know I have a soapbox for this, yourself included. Um, but I am of the belief that poor performance doesn't belong in performance reviews. And I would change a performance review to a performance preview. Where are we going next? And, and this is crucial. That's only good if we're having the poor performance conversations immediately and when we need them. Like leaving it till the end of the quarter or halfway through the year or gracious once a year, that's a disaster and that's not going to work. The key with poor performance is we've got to have that conversation the moment that it's there. The moment yep. we're aware of it. And if we're doing that and the cadence of that is healthy, and, and for some, the cadence of that, that's like one conversation a year. Mm, Jenny, I don't, Jenny, is this your best work? <laughs> nope. Okay, well, what are we going to do to make that your best work? That might be one conversation a year for, for us. For others, it's, it's more. It's more frequent. And the other thing that I lean into within here as well that to remember because we haven't mentioned it a lot of people are learning new skills at the moment and we learn in different ways so be really aware sometimes a, a poor performance is somebody who is a despondent learner because it just all feels too much too overwhelming and everything that's going on that's a different kind of support than the direction that we often talk about so you know leaders on the call there's a huge difference between support and direction so yeah i'd keep it out of there I would, it's got to be in there all day. And that, and that's the thing. Some companies got, get rid of their performance reviews and everybody goes, ah, we don't have them. We don't have to talk. Actually, that just puts the, the pressure on leadership to really do the job because your job is not to prop up poor performance. Not if you want to get the, the results that you're looking for. No, exactly. I remember years ago when I first started my career as a sales manager and I had a trainer at the time who, um, his, his favorite phrase was, are they dancing in your lifeboat? <laughs> you had somebody on your team that was dancing in your lifeboat. Would you stand there and wait for the song to end or would you, uh, sit them down? Mm -hmm. All right. And so you can't wait for the music to, to finish playing in that case. You have to address it. Um, there are tons of questions after you, Jenny, but I think, uh, there's a couple that uh, folks, we will take, we will go through them and we'll see what we can figure out to send in the follow-up that comes along with this conversation. But I think we're also going to figure out how do we bring this conversation back again uh, in the near future. We, you know, we've got our schedule planned out, but we'll take a look and figure out how do we adjust that. But I think the one question here, Jenny, and you touched on it earlier before we wrap up is um, when do you have to, as a manager or a leader, make that coach out decision because all we've been talking about here has been very much how do we coach up it's it's coach up or coach out right and in reality we really want we've invested in these people we they're on our team for a reason right mm -hmm. um when do you make that decision that it's time to coach out i think the easiest version of that is when it's toxic to the rest of the team and interestingly sometimes those are your they're not poor performance in terms of results. So there's a there's a there's another conversation in there. So if they're if they're in the wrong role, like it's very obvious that they're just not in the right place. The for company and for human sake, you know, is there a different role for them within the company? Okay, so we might be coaching them to somewhere else. If it actually is a mismatch between company values and their values or they're just they're done they don't want to be a part of that i think the kindness is in helping them to move on helping them to recognize that 
And going right back to what we were talking about beforehand, um, what do you love about the job that you do? If there is no answer to that, then there is another job where they will just come alive. And that's a, a hard conversation, but a valuable conversation. It's actually a kind conversation because they are spending a lot of hours in the workplace and it's no fun for them as much as it's no fun for you. The other thing I would share here, um, I had a, a leader in a group that we were working with. It was We're actually meeting on Zoom and he showed up and he was just, he was different. We've been working for a couple of months and he was just different. And I caught him in a, in a break on Zoom and I said, you know, Ted, everything looks different. It feels different. And he said, I made a really difficult decision. I had to let somebody go. And I'm like, I'm really sorry to hear that because that is a, that's the worst day for anybody. And he said, it was, it was really tough. I think that we did well with Grace in the situation as it was. He said, but we are two weeks on and my team has come alive. My team is just killing it. Those were his words. Yeah. And he said, I put that conversation off for well over a year. And in two weeks I have reaped the benefit. And that other person is now happily employed elsewhere. So yeah. that sometimes it is the right decision. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the key thing in, in this that we've talked about many times is that, you know, as a leader, you're there because of a reason. Mm -hmm. You've got your instinct, you know, your people trust your gut and mm -hmm. don't delay the conversation, figure out the way that's going to work for you to have that conversation, practice with a colleague, uh, anything to help you engage in that conversation. But Jenny, we're at the point where we need to wrap up and get folks on the way with their day. And uh, we will, uh, again, folks, we will figure out how to uh, come back to some of these questions. There's a couple I'm not sure we're qualified to tackle per se, but we'll figure it out. Uh, I've got Jenny intrigued now. She's looking forward to seeing the, <laughs> the questions. Uh, but Jenny, over to you. Thank you. So for those who are joining us for the first time, we always conclude. And when you're here with us live, we have slides for this. We share these slides afterwards usually, and sometimes with a few extra tucked in there for you too. So don't be afraid to go check them. Um, with one big idea, two applied strategies, and then the ask is for three questions to set you on your way. There's a running joke that I'm not brilliant at numbers, so it's usually more than three. Our big idea, we talked about this right at the very beginning, is you can't have poor performance if you haven't defined poor, if you haven't defined performance. And that's not just you as the leader holding that to yourself. It's got to be a big team discussion and understanding. And it's not one and done. Keep that conversation going. Keep revisiting. What does it look like? Two things that you could take away and use straight away, hopefully. This actually comes from Marcus Buckingham. I've mentioned him a couple of times today. The ratio isn't his, but five to one, five positive to one negative. It's the mark of strong marriages, best relationships, high performing teams. And I liked his language in here. When you're having a performance conversation, especially if you're in that sort of structure of performance reviews and they're regular, but I would say in any one, two good questions. What's working well, right? What works? Let's catch that. Let's to a degree celebrate that like we need to keep that and then this language what are the high priority interrupts and that high priority interrupt means this is having an impact and maybe create your point to the numbers or to the performance of others on the team so therefore we're interrupting it and we need to put a stop to it or we need to change it but that high priority notice it's singular one thing that we need to change and actually there's a video that goes quite well with that. So I'll put that link in our follow-up. A second applied thing that you can use. This is a, a common image. We are talking always as an elephant in the room and you know what happens if we leave those elephants by themselves. So let's get there early, catch it as soon as you see that pattern. And it's always a good idea to start with a healthy question. So three things that will make your question healthy. Okay, don't avoid the pain point. Put some clarity around that. Somebody had half of Brené Brown's quote in the chat earlier. Clear is kind, unclear is unkind. So put some clarity around exactly what it is that we're talking about. Always be constructive. There's no need for cruelty, all right? There's no need for criticism. Just be constructive. What is it that we're trying to elevate? 
And then how will you engage in this together? These are standing side by side conversations. They don't have to be tension conversations. And then three questions. You can see them there. You can start with them to head on your day. So just take a moment today. What's the conversation that you're not having? And then what's the impact of avoiding that? And then I really encourage this. Where can you catch people getting it right? Because the more that we do that, the more that we'll see more of what's going right. And that's really what we're looking for here. And then a fourth one, bonus question for a Friday. What's the worst behavior that you're currently tolerating? And just because I like to look at the other side too, what are some of the best behaviors and are you rewarding them? Because we forget that part too. And that recognition is really important. There you go. Perfect. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, and thank you folks for joining us today. We will be back October 11th and uh, it'll be the start of a double header for us. We're going to go October 11th and 18th. Uh, as on the 25th, I'm going to be in Argentina of all places. Nice. But I've thrown a link in the chat for uh, registration. You will get a registration link uh, following this call and have yourselves a fantastic weekend. Jenny, as always, I appreciate you, everything you bring to these calls. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Yeah. Have a good weekend, everybody.